1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 30 says, Hear the supplication of your servant and of your people Israel, and they pray towards this place. Hear from heaven your dwelling place, and when you hear, forgive. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this, um, this marvellous prayer of Solomon's at the dedication of the temple. We pray that you might um, use his words to speak to us this morning. We pray that in uh, his <coughs> prayer to you all those thousands of years ago, we might find real comfort for today and for tomorrow. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The family gathered together the bits and pieces that they needed for the journey. It would be a full day's walk to get to Jerusalem and they would need some supplies, but fortunately that wasn't a problem. They were plentiful. There was more than enough bread and cheese to have along the way. There was even a little bit of uh, chilled meat left over from the night before. The kids all had newly shod sandals and they wouldn't need to walk most of the way, not now that they were a two donkey family. Looking around, Joe Israelite surveyed the scene. And a milky blue sky as he looked at his home, two bedrooms. I mean, the missus didn't even need to share with the kids anymore, never mind the animals. A bit of land, well irrigated, good for growing. That lovely spot in the corner of the garden where he used to, where he loved to, to sit and read and think in the heat of the day under the shade of the, the leafy, heavy laden fig tree that grew there. That thing just kept producing fruit, a, a constant succulent supply. Amazing. Everyone was well, well rested before the trip. They all slept well now. In fact, they didn't even bother to close the door most nights. The border was only a, a half an hour's journey away. But well, these days, there was no problems. There hadn't been so much as a skirmish for ages now. And boy, they'd been looking forward to going up to the city. They'd heard about what had been happening up there, about the temple. They'd seen some of the caravans taking enormous cedar logs going past nearby. But they hadn't had a chance to see it for themselves. But then a few weeks ago, the, the local elder had come round, bouncing and beaming a summons from Solomon himself. No ifs, no buts, no maybes. Everybody is invited. Everybody needs to be there because it's finished. A national ceremony of dedication, an opportunity to hear from the king and whisper it, maybe a chance to witness God. I mean, that's what happened when they built the tabernacle the Shekinah, the glory cloud. And well, this, this temple, it's bigger, it's better. I mean, who knows? Just maybe. What a thing. What a day. What blessing. On such a day, before such a people, Solomon prays in 1 Kings 8. And as he does so, he pleads with God and he proclaims to his hearers and he tells the story of the people of God. A people who, though at present, are enjoying such blessings by their sin will elicit curse. But who can turn again to God? And in his grace will be heard. 
and find forgiveness. Let's pick up the prayer again in verse 31 of 1 Kings 8. Our passage this morning is 1 Kings 8, verses 31 to 53. When anyone wrongs their neighbour and is required to take an oath and they come and swear the oath before your altar in this temple, then hear from heaven and act. Judge between your servants, condemning the guilty by bringing down on their heads what they have done and vindicating the innocent by treating them in accordance with their innocence. When your people Israel have been defeated by an enemy because they have sinned against you, and when they turn back to you and give praise to your name, praying and making supplication to you in this temple, then hear from heaven and forgive the sin of your people Israel and bring them back to the land you gave to their ancestors. When the heavens are shut up and there is no rain because your people have sinned against you, and when they pray towards this place and give praise to your name and turn from their sin because you have afflicted them, then hear from heaven and forgive the sin of your servants, your people Israel. Teach them the right way to live and send rain on the land you gave your people for an inheritance. When famine or plague comes to the land or blight or mildew, locusts or grasshoppers, or when an enemy besieges them in any of their cities, whatever disaster or disease may come and when a prayer or plea is made by anyone among your people Israel, being aware of the afflictions of their own hearts and spreading out their hands towards this temple, then hear from heaven your dwelling place. Forgive and act, deal with everyone according to all they do, since you know their heart, for you alone know every human heart, so that they will fear you all the time they live in the land you gave our ancestors. As for the foreigner who does not belong to your people of Israel, but has come from a distant land because of your name, for they will hear of your great name, and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm, when they come and pray towards this temple, then hear from heaven your dwelling place. Do whatever the foreigner asks of you, so that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your own people Israel, and may know that this house I have built bears your name. When your people go to war against their enemies, wherever you send them and when they pray to the Lord, towards the city you have chosen and the temple I have built for your name, then hear from heaven their prayer and their plea and uphold their cause. When they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin, and you become angry with them and give them over to their enemies, who take them captive to their own lands far away or near, and if they have a change of heart in the land where they are captive and repent, and plead with you in the land of their captors and say, we have sinned, we have done wrong, we have acted wickedly. And if they turn back to you with all their heart and soul in the land of their enemies who took them captive and pray to you towards the land you gave their ancestors, towards the city you have chosen and the temple I have built for your name, then from heaven, your dwelling place, hear their prayer and their plea and uphold their cause and forgive your people who have sinned against you. Forgive all the offences they have committed against you and cause their captors to show them mercy. For they are your people and your inheritance whom you brought out of Egypt, out of that iron smelting furnace. May your eyes be open to your servant's plea and to the plea of your people Israel and may you listen to them whenever they cry out to you. For you singled them out from all the nations of the world to be your own inheritance just as you declared through your servant Moses when you, sovereign Lord, brought our ancestors out of Egypt. The story of Solomon occupies 11 chapters of 1 Kings and the account of the construction and dedication of the temple is at the heart of that story. And the prayer of Solomon is the high point of that temple account. And the verses we come to today, well, they are at the core of that prayer. Right at the nucleus of what scripture tells us about Israel under her most successful king, at the zenith of her history, is a timeless reminder of God's dealing with humanity. As he prays here, so Solomon 
preaches for anyone who has ears to hear the narrative of our lives. There are four stages. Enjoying blessing. Eliciting curse. Being heard. Finding forgiveness. Firstly, enjoying blessing. And one of our children last year learned the meaning of the phrase restore factory settings when they chose that option on our tablet somehow. Fortunately, reinstalling the few things we had on it was no great disaster. And in some ways, it was a useful lesson for them to learn. The fact that most machines and, and gadgets have a, a reset option that takes you back to the default settings and does anything you might have done to alter its way of working. Well, blessing is God's default setting. Eden didn't need to be earned. It was simply God's pleasure to give Adam and Eve the goodness of the garden for their enjoyment and fruitfulness. And Israel here in 1 Kings, in the promised land during the golden days of bounty under Solomon, they are enjoying blessing that is not due to them by rights, but which has been bestowed upon them in lavish kindness by God. The God who in love chose to make promises to their forefathers, who rescued them from slavery so that they might have freedom, who brought them, despite their grumbling unfaithfulness, into the promised land of milk and honey. God was not compelled to do these things. No one twisted up an arm behind his back. There was no claim which conferred any right for people to benefit from his benevolence. No, God willed and wanted to do so because he loves to give goodness because blessing is God's default setting. At our previous church, they ran some parenting sessions which were given by the other assistant pastor. And like all parents, when we first had our children, we basically didn't have the foggiest what we were supposed to do. So we gratefully went along. And one of the numerous helpful lessons we learned was that we help our children if blessing is the default setting in our homes. I seem to remember you used the phrase the circle of blessing. Children ought to know that within the family they are safe loved, provided for, that they receive good things and they don't have to perform for them. Your favour toward them as parents isn't earned. And it's right that it be like that in Christian homes because that is what God is like. He looks to bless because he loves to bless. Joe Israelite standing at the temple as Solomon prayed on this day he knew that. They lived it. And though we often shamefully forget it, so do we. Every good thing we have, every day, every breath, every plate of enjoyable, nutritious food that we eat, every daily necessity and every extravagant treat, it is all the enjoyment of God's blessing. In thinking about this, I originally wrote that the pandemic should have caused us to, to realise, to appreciate the blessings that we usually enjoy. And that is true, of course. But you know what? Our experience of life during the pandemic ought to be just as much a prompt to praise to God for his generosity toward us. We have more, so much more than we deserve because God gives abundant blessing. That is what they knew. That is what they enjoyed here in the days of Solomon. Blessing is God's default setting. 
But just as they enjoyed blessing, well, so Solomon prayed before a people who would be eliciting curse. Solomon, in wisdom and faithfulness, reigned over a period of unprecedented peace and prosperity. And yet Solomon was wise enough to know that it would not always be thus. Mosaic law instructed the king to, to copy out the law repeatedly so that he might be thoroughly versed in God's word and instruction. And it would appear, I think, from his prayer here that Solomon was. In particular, this prayer reveals that he had read and taken to heart passages like Leviticus chapter 26 and Deuteronomy 28. Those are two chapters that lay out the, the consequences of covenant keeping in obedience or covenant breaking on the part of the people. Solomon knows that the faithfulness of God guarantees that he will never fail in his covenant keeping. And yet he also knows that there are two parties in every covenant. And sin, well, that is the ever present fly, the ever present breeding swarm of flies in the ointment of the human heart. Sin is the spanner in the works of the people and God continuing on together in perpetual harmony. Because no amount of blessing, even such as they had in Solomon's day, no amount of blessing will ever be enough. It's like spoiled kids in selfishness and rebellion, disobedient and destructive people always wander away. From God and out of the circle of blessing. That may be the default, but it is not indefinite. And so, again, confounding expectations. Much of Solomon's prayer here, as we see, is taken up with describing not the fruit of blessing, but the fright of curse. Curse which would be brought about as a result of the disobedience of the people, of sin. There are seven sections in the, the bit of the prayer that we're looking at this morning. There's dispute in verses 31 and 32. Defeat in verses 33 and 34. Drought in verses 35 and 36. Disaster and disease in verses 37 to 40. Distance in verses 41 to 43. Duel, we're stretching it now a little bit, kind of war in verses 44 and 45. And then finally, displacement in verses 46 to 51. Exile. It is a whole catalogue of painful prospects. Five of the seven of which Solomon announces will come about as a direct result of sin. Verse 33, when your people Israel have been defeated by an enemy because they have sinned against you. Verse 35, another example, when the heavens are shut up and there is no rain because your people have sinned against you. Not all of the difficulties they might find themselves in could be directly attributed to resulting from their sin, but many, most, will be. Now, we won't turn to Leviticus 26 or Deuteronomy 28 at this point, but it would be worth you making a note of those references. Let me give you them again. Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 26 and Deuteronomy, chap, Deuteronomy chapter 28. It may be worth you just having a look at them a little bit later. Because the scenarios that Solomon describes here echo very closely those warned about by God through Moses in those two places. Solomon's prayer here is not fueled by a, a furtive, pessimistic imagination. He has simply heard what God has said. 
And he is wise enough to know what people are like. And so at the point of Israel's greatest achievement, Solomon reminds the people repeatedly of their greatest flaw. A flaw that for all his greatness, he is clear-sighted enough to know has not been fixed. The reign of Solomon cured many of Israel's ills, but sin was still endemic. And so he delivers no tub-thumping speech at the dedication, none of the sort of self-confidence that we get at great national political occasions now. Be the change you want to see. Together we can do it. The future generations are our great hope for a brighter tomorrow. No, there's none of that. He delivers a hard reality check. We will be our own downfall. The progression through the, the prayer is painful. From domestic disagreement in verse 31, right through to verse 46, when they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin, and you become angry with them and give them over to their enemies, who take them captive to their own lands, far away or near. This is the absolute low. Just imagine Joe Israelite taking this in. Supposing we sin. In fact, he doesn't even say that, does he? He says, when we sin. And as a consequence, we are carted off into exile removed from the, the land of promise and severed from the place of God's name, from this place. The dedication of the temple in the midst of the land of plenty. Solomon pleads with God for the people when it is all gone. God loves to bless. But he must also give sin its just deserts. And it's not that that's just like the, the bad news side of the coin, because God's justice is in itself a blessing. Because we don't want to live in a world where wrong is unfettered and evil triumphs unchecked. And so we must come to terms with the reality that as people we enjoy blessing. But, and of course we know this, is so obvious to us. We also elicit and encounter curse. Dispute, defeat, drought, disaster, disease. The scars of sin writ large upon our world and lives. But even in that, there is a kindness. Because the experience of curse, just as Solomon describes it here for the people, the experience of curse is the symptom that ought to prompt people to take action like the fever or the continuous cough or the loss of taste and smell. Those things are not good, but better than to be overtaken in an instant. At least in recognising the symptoms, you can book an appointment, you can get a test, you can take action, seek help. Well, so Solomon prays here, the supplication of your people Israel when they pray towards this place here from heaven, your dwelling place, and when you hear, forgive. When anyone wrongs their neighbour and is required to take an oath and they come and swear the oath before the, your altar in this temple, then hear from heaven and act. 
Uh, when your people Israel have been, so this is verse 33, when your people Israel have been defeated by an enemy because they've sinned against you, and when they turn back to you and give praise to your name, praying and making supplication to you in this temple, then hear from heaven and forgive the sin of your people Israel. When the heavens are shut up, verse 35, and there's no rain because your people have sinned against you, and when they pray towards this place and give praise to your name and turn from their sin because you have afflicted them, then hear from heaven and forgive the sin of your servants, your people, Israel. You see, amidst the depths of curse, there is blessing still. Because there is blessing in being heard. We thought last week about the fact that the, the temple represents not an actual home for God on earth, but a point of connection between people and God in heaven. And in these verses of the prayer, we see why that is so vital. As again and again, as we've just read, God calls, Solomon calls upon God to hear his people when they call upon him at and toward the temple. The temple, that is the, the tangible focal point and a visible demonstration of God's willing, his wanting to be in relationship with his people. It was as if through the temple's being there, God was saying, look, here I am. Come to me, call upon me. Our kids have a, a great grandmother who's now well on in her 90s and pretty fine fettle. But the other week, one of her carers was taken ill while she was in her house. The great granny remarkably put her into the recovery position and pulled the red cord. You'll know the ones, you may have one, uh, in fact. The red cord that puts her through to somebody who can help. Well, the temple was no red cord, but it was more like a golden beacon allowing the people to be put through to heaven, to cry out for help. And in this prayer, we see the power, we see the, the range of the temple's reach. As we go through, it's like concentric circles moving out. Verse 31, when anyone wrongs their neighbour and is required to take an oath, and they come and swear the oath before your altar in this temple. So there we are, verse 31, before the altar. Verse 33, when your people Israel have been defeated by an enemy because they've sinned against you, and when they turn back to you and give praise to your name, praying and making supplication to you in this temple. So we're not before the altar now, but we're still in the temple. Verse 35, when they pray towards this place and give praise to your name and turn from their sin because you have afflicted them. So they're just praying now towards the temple. We go forward a little bit to verse 44. When they pray to the Lord towards the city you have chosen and towards the temple I have built so that they're no longer even in the land. They're, sorry, they're no longer even in Jerusalem. They're still in the land, but they're praying towards the city, towards the temple. And then finally, verse 48. And if they turn back to you with all their hearts and soul in the land of their enemies who took them captive and pray to you towards the land you gave their ancestors, towards the city you have chosen and the temple I have built for your name, then from heaven your dwelling place, hear their prayer and their plea. From before the altar to beyond the borders, Solomon prays that God might hear his people when his people turn toward the temple, when they physically, if you like, demonstrate their devotional dependence in turning from their sin, in recognising their plight as a cursed people, and in repentance come back to Yahweh. Years later, we, we find the likes of Daniel and Nehemiah doing just that. Solomon implores God to hear. But at the same time, he instructs the people to call out when this happens, and it will, this is what you must do. 
aware of their own sin, awakened by the consequences of curse, there is still hope in being heard. There is a cord to pull that reaches into the very throne room of heaven. The ability to repent, the freedom to pray, well, they are no trifling thing. Solomon saw that such was the lifeline of his people. And so as we come to God and we cry out to him, we ought to do so marvelling that we may. And that we might be sure that the connection is good. That the passage of our prayers to the ears of God himself is more stable and reliable than the Wi-Fi in our living room. And yet, of course, we don't turn to a particular location. We pray in a particular name. A few weeks ago, we studied John chapter 4. In our Bible studies, the Samaritan woman at the well who says to Jesus, where must we worship? Jerusalem, the temple or the mountain where? And Jesus says to her, a day is coming and is now here when the worshippers will worship in spirit and in truth, not in a place, but by a person. And he tells her, I the one speaking to you, I am he. Jesus is the true temple. And so we look to him. We pray in his name. And in doing so, we know that amidst the constant struggles of our sin and the agonies of days in a cursed world, we are heard. And as those who pray in Christ, we can be sure that when we turn in faith, we find forgiveness. Let's go back to verse 46. To the day when it is all fallen apart. The original readers of kings, they likely lived in such a day, separated, exiled, and enslaved. Well, then what? Verse 47, if they have a change of heart in the land where they are held captive and repent and plead with you in the land of their captors and say, we have sinned, we have done wrong, we have acted wickedly, and if they turn back to you with all their heart and soul in the land of their enemies who took them captive and pray to you towards the land you gave their ancestors, towards the city you have chosen and the temple I have built for your name, then from heaven your dwelling place, hear their prayer and their plea and uphold their cause. And forgive your people who have sinned against you. Forgive all the offences they have committed against you and cause their captors to show them mercy, for they are your people and your inheritance, whom you brought out of Egypt, out of that iron smelting furnace. As Joe Israelite Junior Junior sits in rags and chains in Babylon, he reads the words of Solomon and a realisation dawns upon him. We are not forgotten. We are not forsaken. We are not condemned to curse forever. There is a way back. Just as God had rescued from Egypt, so he could again, so he would again. We are here by our own devices and though we are powerless to save ourselves, 
Our God is powerful to save. And he calls upon us to call upon him so that he might do so. So that our sin might be rolled back and we might be forgiven and restored. That is the heart-rending opportunity that Solomon lays before them. If it isn't beautiful to us, then I suspect we may not have fully grasped the ugly horror of sin and judgment and curse and the exquisite love, mercy and forgiveness of God. Because, friends, this is the gospel of grace right here in the guts of the Old Testament. Sin deserving judgment met with forgiveness and restoration when people turn to God in repentance. Forgiveness unmerited, unearned, because God in love has chosen and he has come to make a way and he has made that way known. And this has always been God's way. Just as the the curses that Solomon describes come straight from the Mosaic law, well, so does the grace. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, we read these words. Even if you have been banished to the most distant land under the heavens, from there the Lord your God will gather you and bring you back. He will bring you to the land that belonged to your ancestors and you will take possession of it. He will make you more prosperous and numerous than your ancestors. The Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants so that you may love him with all your heart and with all your soul and live. Deuteronomy chapter 30 verses 4 to 6, Solomon takes that prophecy That promise, and he turns it into a prayer. Because he knows that what God has said with his mouth, he will do with his hands. Now that gospel, that same promise of forgiveness and restoration, for if we will only repent, that is the very same. But again, there is no Christian temple building, nor is there any need of such a thing. We don't look toward Jerusalem because Jesus, he is the true temple. And at the cross, full and final atonement has been made for sin. And Christ has been raised, a temple built in three days. And even now he intercedes for us, holding out his righteousness and pleading our case before the Father. The God of all blessing, love and faithfulness, all mercy, grace and forgiveness. He is, we'll think about a little bit more next week, he is the God of the whole world. If he is not your God this morning then know that you are invited, you are implored to come to him in Christ and find forgiveness and restoration and life. And you need not go anywhere to do so. You can do it right wherever you are, right now. You could echo Solomon's prayer for yourself, knowing that this prayer has been answered in Jesus. Knowing that God will forgive all those who turn to him in repentance so that sin and curse might not be our eternal condition, but that we might be restored, brought brought back to the blessing that we were made for beyond the blessing we have ever known. 
who enjoy the blessed life that God longs to give. Let's pray. Then from heaven, your dwelling place, hear their prayer and their plea and forgive your people. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Solomon's clear sightedness. We thank you that he saw sin, that he recognised the just consequence of curse, but that he also knew you. The God who in condescending grace had come to, to be amongst his people, who in the temple gave them somewhere to look toward, to know that they would be heard. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have surpassed even that grace and mercy in coming in Christ, in dying and in rising again, so that we might look to him, so that we might pray and repent in his name. Heavenly Father, please forgive us our sin. Please forgive us when we do not see our sin or we treat it as a casual, small thing. Please forgive us where we have grown comfortable and accustomed to the curse of this world. Please, Heavenly Father, in our need, help us to cry out to you, to plead Christ's righteousness to rely upon your mercy and to rest in the assurance of forgiveness and restoration and life evermore. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, even in the face of life's pains, even in the face of Uh, the consequences of curse. We have great hope and joy in what we know of God and in knowing our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's reflected in the words of our uh, final hymn, When Peace Like a River.